The City of London was where the Mayflower was organised and financed. It's where the negotiations took place between the pilgrim leaders and the city merchants. Southwark um, was the centre of the pilgrim church. And this pilgrim church had started at the end of the 16th century and it had suffered a lot of persecution. And uh, the Mayflower pilgrims looked to this church as their founding church. So we've got the, the financing and organising of, uh, of the Mayflower expedition uh, in the city of London, and then we've got the, uh, the ship and we've got the church, all in this area. Tell me, what, what are we looking at here? So we've got uh, on display here a few of the company's archives pertaining to the Howland family. Um, first of all, we'll start with this, this book. This is a, a manuscript register which was compiled by a gentleman called Percival Boyd. He um, was a member of the company. He rose up through the hierarchy, became a master. Um, he was also an avid uh, genealogist and an insomniac. So he spent a huge amount of his uh, waking hours doing family research, not just of his own family, but using the Draper's Company archives to look at all the past apprentices and freemen over the centuries. Now we have archives that go back to 1475. So he did go uh, and look through our, um, our minutes, our accounts and our membership records. And he also went to external sources such as wills and parish registers. And what he compiled is um, this register and it is arranged by family name and then within datal order by family name. So here we have the Howland and the first uh, Howland is, is Humphrey and he then, Percival Boyd, then summarises all the information that he's gleaned from these various uh, uh, resources. We then move on to Simon um, who uh, was apprentice to Humphrey and then to Henry who was also apprenticed to, uh, to Humphrey. I'm standing outside a substantial yeoman house in nearby God Manchester. This was built when John Howland was just a boy. And you can see the original door and some other original features of the house uh, just behind me. The door is dated 1603. Only the most substantial and wealthy houses have survived until today. The poorer houses uh, have just crumbled away. The house is built of wattle and daub and has a timber construction. Well, here we have our, what I think is fairly typical 17th century garden with very many vegetable uh, uh, herbs that we would use for flavouring and, um, and medic medicinal uses too, and useful ones too. Um, sage, for instance, is very good in, in, in the pottage, but it's also good for cleaning your teeth and freshening your breath. Rosemary, which everybody knows, is a wonderful herb. Um, and but it isn't only for flavouring, we would uh, dress our doors with it um, and go round the door, bashing the door, so the, the oils would um, keep the devil away. If you actually want weaving wool, you spin it this way with the grain and you get smooth wool which is stronger. So the simplest way of spinning is just using a drop spindle and you simply take the, the fuzz of wool, tease it out and put a twist in it. It's the twist that gives it the strength and you put as much twist as you need. For knitting wool, you don't need a great deal. Uh, if you're going to use it for weaving to make it strong, you put, put more twist in. But it is a very slow process. During World War II, Southampton was a major target for German bombers. The docks, warehouses and wartime factories, especially the ones building Spitfires, were destroyed in September 1940. Raids in November 1940 levelled much of the town centre, including Holyrood, the church which the pilgrims would have been very familiar with and which John Winthrop may have delivered his famous sermon, A Model of Christian Charity, before the Winthrop fleet 
left England in the summer of 1630. Today the port is a major employer and handles freight in and out of England and is home to the largest cruise ship terminal in Europe. Southampton has the, the dubious record of, of having the first known privateer ever, which was a man called Robert Reniger in 1545 when he had had a, a cargo of wheat sequestered in a Spanish port and it had gone rotten. So he decided to seize a Spanish ship and take the amount uh, that wheat was worth off the ship. The ship he decided to uh, privateer was actually full of an illegal gold shipment, so he got more than he bargained for. He came back to England, the King of Spain complained to Henry VIII. Henry VIII called Robert Reniger up to court, told him off, and then made him controller of customs in Southampton. So he became the richest man in Southampton. And so other merchants are looking and thinking, oh, this is a pretty good idea. You know, Spain, you know, things are becoming tricky with Spain. They are you know, becoming an enemy. But they've got all this money. Spain and Portugal by this time have um, discovered South America and all its riches, including ginger, sugar, and silver. And it's much easier to take that off ships coming back than actually trying to do that yourself. So Southampton became involved in privateering because they could also provide all the goods you needed to then launder those cargoes as they come through the port, through the customs setup, and because the mayor of Southampton is also admiral of the port. And so he could deal with any disputes as well. Well, this is a model of the Mayflower as she sailed to America in 1620. Um, typical merchant ship of the time, uh, overall length of about 140 feet and about 95 feet on the deck here. Uh, three masted, very typical, five, six sails in the normal arrangement and the rigging uh, as a typical of the period. Um, she's laid out in three main decks, the, the top deck here, the, what we call the weather deck. There'll be a second deck, which is about at this level, uh, where the passengers would have lived. And then we have the hold at the bottom where the cargo and all their belongings would have been kept. Uh, we have uh, the typical coloration that was put on these ships. Uh, we believe that this type of coloring was typical for a specific merchant. So he would paint his own colors so he could recognize his ship and others could as well. Um, on the main deck, we have some cannons. Uh, these are purely defensive because piracy was still rife in that period. Um, very few cannons. Because of the small crews that these ships carried, they couldn't fight a large number of cannons. So she's not a warship as such. But ships over 100 tons, because there was no formal navy at the time, were expected to uh, organize themselves into small fighting groups for defense if necessary. The water line of the ship is, is at, at about this height here. Um, quite a lot under the water, very bulbous, barrel shaped to carry the maximum cargo. The bow sprit, this is called the beak, extends over the water. This, this would have been um, the place that they would have used as their toilet over, to go immediately over the side. Very exposed in bad weather. Well, of course, the Great Migration has been applied to many uh, large migrations in history, in the, both in the United States and elsewhere. But the one that I'm interested in is the earliest settlement of New England by people mostly from uh, England. Uh, it began in 1620, of course, with the Mayflower, and that's where we are here now in the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the Mayflower in Plymouth. And it went on for 20 years. It was quite slow early on. There were maybe only a few dozen or a couple of hundred a year from 1620 to 1630. But then in 1630, the pace of migration picked up to a few hundred a year. And then by 1634, it was two or 3,000 a year right through until 1640. So it's just a 20 year period when about 20,000 uh, English men, women and children uh, came to New England. Uh, heaviest areas of migration to New England were from East Anglia, Essex uh, and Suffolk and to a lesser extent Norfolk, also in Kent. And then as you move forward, uh, Lincolnshire was fairly strong and then uh, 
then there was also a strong West Country element. The Reverend John White at Dorchester and Dorset had begun organizing migration uh, ahead of the Winthrop Fleet in the 1620s. London was very important, and I was very conscious of this, because of the names of the people who lived and worked in London. Um, I've calculated that 59 of the Mayflower passengers lived and worked in London at, at one time. And that's just the definites and the probables. There are several May Mayflower passengers that we don't know very much about uh, who may well have lived or worked in, in London as, as, as well. The majority of the passengers who did embark, embarked in London. Um, so that's another factor. And um, if you look at the whole, uh, uh, the whole picture too, there was a church in London, the Southwark Church, and that church was the Brownist Church. The, the Leiden Church, the Amsterdam Church, all the Brownist churches looked to the London Church as their mother church. Even in the 1650s, um, Bradford is writing that the mother church was the 1592 uh, church in London. So the history, uh, the oral history that was passed down was that it wasn't okay to be an Indian and it wasn't safe to be an Indian. Um, history in, our, in the history books and the documents, it also proves that and shows that. Um, Miles Standish, who was one of the captains on the ship of the Mayflower who came over, when he got to one of our villages called West Augustus, or West Augustus, what they call it today, which is today's present-day Weymouth, um, murders began to happen. So the museum has a number of treasures on display. We're very lucky that many of the items uh, that we have here are actually on loan to us from the Cromwell family, uh, from Cromwell's immediate descendants, and therefore have a very good provenance to them. Uh, we have an extremely good art collection. Most of the major artists of the mid 17th century are represented here, uh, including William Dobson, Robert Walker, Samuel Cooper, Sir Peter Lely, and so forth. Uh, we have uh, one of the copies of Sir Peter Lely's famous painting of Cromwell, uh, which is of course reputedly is the one where Cromwell asked to be painted warts and everything. Uh, the slight misquotation nowadays, we remember it as warts and all. The 21st century is full of rapid change and so many unknowns. We're dealing with artificial intelligence, all sorts of questions, biomedical, engineering. And the question is, how do people respond to that change? The Mayflower story is about how people were coping with change, economic change, religious change, political change, technical change. All of these opened up new worlds, new possibilities, unknowns. The pilgrims had the courage to embark into the unknown and embrace that change.